Okay, guys. So we'll start. Uh, so this presentation, you guys are aware, it's on international trade. Okay. So uh, we'll just. So it might be a little bit boring. Okay. I hope everyone is comfortable with English. Yeah, everyone is comfortable. So even if you're not, you have to get comfortable because if you want to go in for a manage, most of you guys are interested in a, ma a management degree, right? Is that correct? Right. So if you have to get, uh, if you want to go in for management and careers in management, you have to get uh, comfortable with English. So you should work on it on your own. If you're if you're right now not 100% comfortable, you should work on that. And uh, anyway, so I'll, I'll just start. And uh, so this this lecture might be a little bit boring because I was given this topic of international trade. So if you want to cover international trade, uh, you have to go through a little bit of the history of international trade, how it developed and all that. So that might get a little bit boring, you know, in terms of how, but I'll try to make it as interesting as possible. But in, anyway, this is stuff that you guys need to know. If you're going into most of the stuff that I'm covering here is uh, going to be material that you need to know if you are going to be involved in the world of business. So it's good to have that sense of uh, how things have developed. And so, so it's a, take it like a lecture, even if you don't find it very interesting, it's stuff that you need to know. So uh, we'll just try to follow that. Okay. So the way I've structured the presentation, let's see here. Okay. So we will just try to go with this kind of a, a structure, follow this kind of structure in uh, in the in the presentation. So let's go one by one. So first, we have, what we have to look at is the post-war history of uh, international trade. We are not starting from before the uh, the Second World War, which is ended in 1945. So we are just going to look at the post-war that we call the post-war uh, period. So we will just start with that and see how uh, some of the institutions came came about. Okay. So here you have uh, what you have in 1944, essentially from they started planning from 1944 itself, the British and the Americans, and you had this famous Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, which was in the US, uh, with the mainly with the people who won the war, okay, the Allied powers. So Britain, Russia, and uh, the, uh, the United States, and some of the European, and some of the European, the, the French, and the and the uh, other European powers. So uh, and also there was a plan to reconstruct Germany. So you had this agreement and what you essentially got as a result of this agreement is uh, you had the currencies of these major powers they were made convertible for the purposes of trade okay you know what freely convertible means that you can freely exchange those currencies to pay for trade payments uh, and uh, the other thing that happened was the exchange rates were all fixed against the us dollar okay the, all the exchange rates were fixed against the us dollar just to give you an idea of what that means i'll just try to cook up um, just, just to give you an idea how things move so this is a, uh, this is a chart of the uh, US uh, of the British pound against the US dollar okay so this is the modern day uh, period in uh, international exchange in uh, in currency markets so you can see here how uh, you know how volatile the currency markets are you can see how this is actually the value of the British pound in terms of US dollars okay so when you see 2.1 there when you see 2.1 there, that is 2.1 means that 2.1 US dollars per British pound. Okay, so you can see here in the modern era, which we are here looking at a chart between say 2010 to 2000, to starting from 2003. So you can see between 2000, uh, say five six, and between 2015, how much movement, how much of a depreciation there was in the British pound. Okay, so this is the modern day era in uh, currency markets. Okay, now this did not happen in 1945. What we had in 1945 was a system of fixed exchange rates, which stayed in place pretty much from 1945, all the way till 1971-72 when, uh, when the system was broken. So there was a period, there was a regime after the war when exchange rates were fixed. So this kind of stuff was not happening between 1945 and 1971s essentially okay so this is the modern era where you can see how volatile currency markets are but uh, in the post-war period the meaning of the statement that uh, exchange rates were fixed the meaning of the statement essentially is that you did not have the kind of fluctu fluctuations which you just now saw on that particular chart right you getting the point here okay if you guys have any questions at any point of time just ask okay if i think that something needs to be uh, dealt with later i will postpone it otherwise i'll just uh, address so if i say something and you don't understand something just put up your hand and ask okay i don't want anyway the material is a little bit 
kind of scholarly so i don't want to make it too boring if you have any question just put up your hand and ask okay it's meant to give you guys uh, some clarity so the fx rates were fixed okay and the other important thing that happened was that the price of gold okay once again if you look at the price of gold xau is a symbol that we use for many of you guys have uh, i think you remember your periodic table do you remember periodic table what was the symbol for gold au right and what was the symbol for silver ag right so in the international markets actually gold and silver are traded very actively okay so uh, these uh, the symbols for these uh, car, uh, assets gold and silver the symbols are xau and xag for gold and silver they're taken from the periodic table and then you also have in the precious metal market you have also platinum and palladium also trading so uh, so the other thing that happened in 1945 was that the value of the us dollar was fixed against gold okay so you could actually take any us dollars to the french if a french company had earned uh, uh, if the french government had earned a lot of us dollars because french companies were exporting to the us okay so as a result of that the us customers were paying the french companies and let's say the french government has accumulated a big supply of dollars okay are you following this logic okay if the french sell to the americans the americans would pay them in dollars and so the french would have a balance of dollars that they have earned from selling to the americans okay so this amount of money that the dollars that the french had they could actually tender that back to the united states and say okay i don't want these dollars give me gold at the rate of 35 uh, 35 uh, dollars per troy ounce of gold okay so gold in the international markets is traded not like here we have a 10 grams okay so it is traded as uh, was it 10 grams or 100 grams i think it's 10 grams right so um, here uh, where in the international markets gold is traded as uh, on in uh, in terms of one troy ounce uh, dollars per troy ounce troy ounce is a different measure from pure ounce okay slightly different measure you can google it so gold is traded in international markets as, as dollars per troy ounce and in 1945 the go, uh, the price of gold was fixed at 35 dollars per troy ounce so essentially what the french could do is if they have all these dollars they, they could just go to the us and say take these dollars and give me some gold at the rate of 35 dollars per troy ounce is this clear and in fact this is the kind of behavior that broke down the system okay because what happened was that the us started uh, running very large deficits trade deficits with a lot of countries uh, even including the french and the french leader uh, charles de gaulle i don't know if you've heard of this guy he's a uh, that area a, a leader from that age so charles de gaulle wanted to embarrass the americans so what he wanted to he kept on uh, you know tendering dollars and you know he wanted to take all the gold from the americans so he kept on tendering dollars and he kept on demanding gold in return so eventually what happened was the u.s president nixon he got fed up and said okay this system is over now okay the game is over i'm changing the rules of the game so i'm not going to give you dollars so i'm changing this fixed parity system i don't like this so from tomorrow we will no longer uh, you know exchange uh, gold for dollars at 35 dollars an ounce okay so essentially that was the end of the uh, fixed price regime for gold so today if you look at gold once again in the international markets okay i'll show you one more chart of gold Yeah, so this is how gold has been moving if you see from 1998. So tremendous amount of movement. This is the same thing that what that which used to be fixed between 1945 to 1971. That which used to be fixed at $35 an ounce, that used to be just a straight line. There was no movement on the chart. But after this 1971 period when Nixon broke the gold standard, that was the gold standard, the regime of the gold standard. So Nixon took the US off the gold standard by saying basically that I don't like this. Uh, so we are going to go off the system. So now you see the kind of volatility that you get in gold. Okay, you can see how much the price has moved. Okay, there's a tremendous rally in the price of gold, then there's a decline. Now it's kind of consolidating. So this is the kind of volatility that you have in international gold markets. Okay, this is again something uh, to be aware of, as because although India is one of the biggest, uh, we are kind of alternating with China as one of the biggest buyers of gold, but we don't actually set the international gold price. The international gold price is set in markets, is mainly set in London, which is the main center for trading precious metals. But it is actually a 24-hour uh, market, 24 into 5, okay, 
uh, market that trades gold, okay, gold, silver, platinum, etc. And that's where the international price is set. So this is what happens when you go off fixed rates. So this is another thing that happened in 1945. We had fixed rates, not this kind of volatility. Okay. So the other thing that has happened in 1945 is they set up the the IMF and the World Bank Group. You guys have all heard of these guys, IMF and World Bank. You know that in 1991, when India had some balance of payments problems, so the IMF came in and gave us uh, gave us some emergency assistance, etc., on foreign exchange with foreign exchange loans and stuff. So that's these are the the International Monetary Fund is uh, essentially like kind of helping out all the sovereign nations with their cash flow problems in foreign currencies when they are short of cash they make loans like if you know Pakistan right now is going to the IMF okay for um, of, uh, for a loan etc because they have they are not in good, good shape and the World Bank group essentially uh, does a lot of these infrastructure financing they have a lot of uh, elements in the World Bank group uh, there are about five institutions within the World Bank group you can google that and see including the, the, there's a settlement for there's also a center called uh, I know, ISDS the International Settlement for uh, you know dispute settlement okay that settles all these trade uh, you can settle all kinds of disputes arbitration uh, mechanisms are provided so it's a complex group the organ the World Bank group so this is basically what happened in Bretton Woods and then what we had was we also had in 1948 we formed another have you guys heard of this organization GATT okay you might have had to do it for your GK prep, prep and all that right so this GATT was also formed it was formed in 1948 that was a general agreement on tariffs and trade and the objective of the GATT was essentially to uh, continuously have rounds of negotiations okay and try and bring down the tariffs okay you understand what tariffs are we'll deal with tariffs a little bit later but you know what tariffs are yeah these are like import duties okay so it's essentially import taxes okay so if we have tariffs in india on let's say the import of uh, say steel that means that any foreign steel that is coming into india whatever their price is uh, additionally we will add some tariffs okay we'll add some five percent tariff or ten whatever the tariff is so the idea was uh, when they formed the GATT, the idea was that they would uh, progressively bring down all the tariffs because in that time in 1945-46 they had very high tariffs around the world so what they wanted to do was actually uh, bring down uh, the tariffs, uh, tariff rates around the world and uh, have some kind of uh, you know move towards freer trade because trade would bring prosperity okay so that was the idea and so they had several negotiations okay between under the uh, GATT framework and um, they had like between 48 and 94 the last one is called the Uruguay round in 1994 okay and when they did this Uruguay round in 1994 they did uh, because before 1994 what we had was all these negotiations before 1994 they were all focused on trade and goods okay you understand the difference between goods and services okay so the pre-94 uh, discussions related only to trade in goods not to services trade or intellectual property etc so what they did in 94 is that they expanded the scope of the agreement okay and tried to cover agriculture services markets okay so it was not just goods anymore but agriculture services and also ipr ipr is international uh, sorry intellectual property rights okay so there was an agreement on the trade related so something called trips trips okay it's the trade related intellectual pro intellectual property rights so they had an agreement on that as well and so this is what happened in the Uruguay round in 1994 so if you see uh, essentially uh, so this is what happened so you see the progress from you set up the after the Bretton Woods agreement you set up GATT you go through rounds of uh, several rounds of negotiations trying to bring down tariffs on goods and then in 1994 you extend the scope of those uh, you know trade liberalization measures to not just goods but also services and agriculture and also uh, intellectual property rights okay so the, the the world is moving slowly towards freer and freer trade okay uh, then after that you had also this another important thing that happened after the conclusion of the uruguay round is they formed what is called you guys have also heard of this one wto okay so this is the world trade organization so this also was formed it was not there in 1948 although they wanted to set up something like that but it wasn't possible so this came up in 1995 pretty much close to the uh, the uruguay round end, ending of the uruguay round 
okay so essentially here you can see the same um, the other things that were added in the WTO agreement was also the you, you had uh, new procedures for settling disputes under international trade law so a new uh, branch of the law started to be developed further that is international trade law okay that is happening under the auspices of the WTO okay so all this happened and then um, so you see progressive uh, movement on a multilateral basis all this stuff is happening on a multilateral basis right you understand the difference between multilateral and bilateral bilateral is if I do a deal with him between the two of us that's a bilateral transaction multilateral is if all of us get together in this room and all of us agree on certain common terms that will apply to all transactions between all parties okay so that's a multilateral agreement so what you're seeing here and all these kinds of uh, agreements like the GATT the, uh, the WTO these are all multilateral frameworks for negotiating international trade uh, terms of international trade okay so this is a, this is the framework that you had and you continued with that and then eventually we had this new round called the Doha round okay that is based because it was started in the Doha Qatar so this was called the Doha round that came up in 2001 okay and this is still going on actually uh, it's very difficult to get agreement on uh, because India has also been uh, uh, has also been pressing certain demands okay so we have also not we are one of the countries that actually is uh, holding up the finalization of the Doha round okay so uh, because we are not getting some of the things that we want so this Doha round actually there was one twist made in the Doha round is that they tried to bring in a special focus on developing countries so that's why this Doha round of talks is governed by what is sometimes called the Doha development agenda which means here one of the things they said was that we will make a special we will make some special concessions for uh, remember this is a multilateral setting so all the international board uh, all the countries are there the developing countries and the developed countries so the developed countries agreed that we would make some special concessions for uh, developing countries okay and one of the things that you know most developing many developing countries like in Africa okay they are big exporters of agricultural products because a lot of agricultural products are found in, in even in the Caribbean you know they, they sell a lot of bananas and all kinds of stuff so a lot of developing countries because they're quite poor they don't have technology they don't have an industrial base but some of them uh, may have a lot of agricultural products to sell because it's easier to you know produce those so the uh, idea was that the developing the developed countries like the Western countries would open up more of their markets to agricultural exports from the developing countries okay this was one of the ideas that was floated in the Doha round this would essentially the idea was that uh, we would try to you know make some extra effort to bring up the developing countries okay that was the idea so uh, this is essentially what you see and now you have the WTO membership is about uh, 164 uh, countries it covers a lot of international trade most a big part of international trade and this is essentially broadly as I said this part might have been a little bit boring because uh, it, it's just kind of history but it's important to be aware of how things uh, develop because you le learn a lot of things about how uh, you know countries and people work together by reading history okay so now this is more interesting right Trump is more interesting is, is, is that right more interesting than the history of global trade okay so one of the things that you see very, is very interesting stuff that is happening uh, because of the positions that Trump has taken okay uh, and uh, in fact let me just go back a little bit and see you have this WTO and you see 164 countries in the WTO right so one of the countries that got into the WTO I think this happened in uh, not sure maybe uh, it's about uh, 20 years ago so it's about 2001 I think and I think 2001 or so China entered the WTO okay so China obviously is a very big economy and a very big force in, in the global economy so one major event happened in around 2001 that is China entry into the WTO and many people were afraid of what that what that would do to their own prospects so you know they put in a lot of conditions etc but essentially what has happened is China's one of the problems that has happened is that many of the countries around the world and I think gen nobody disputes this most countries uh, even the the Western European countries uh, the Japanese uh, the Asians almost everybody agrees universally that China has not uh, fulfilled its commitments under the WTO so China made certain agreements okay they, they promised certain things but they haven't delivered on their promises okay so they have kind of cheated if you want to be very uh, you know what you don't care about being diplomatic 
then you say that uh, like Trump, Trump is not very diplomatic. So President Trump would say that they have been cheating. Okay, so you agree to certain terms and then you don't fulfill those terms. So it's like cheating. Okay, so now the thing that has happened is that China has not been playing fair in international trade and they have not been adhering to what they agreed to under the WTO. But no other country, no country in the world until Trump came along, no leader, no global leader, like whether it's any leader in France or Germany, okay, or Japan, anywhere, nobody ever called them out. It's like, you know, that somebody's cheating. Okay, it's like somebody's people are playing a game and you know that someone is cheating and nobody, everyone knows that they're cheating, but nobody has the guts to say that you guys, you just point to this guy and say you're cheating. Okay, in front of everybody. Nobody has the guts. You know, this happens also sometimes. In, you know in social settings and other settings it's just because nobody had the guts to do it because everybody was too afraid that you know i mean why should i say something so uh, unpopular and unpalatable and i'm going to rock the boat most people don't want to rock the boat that's the problem they don't want to say something which is so shocking so what happens so, so the reason that uh, president trump is very interesting is because he doesn't give a damn okay he just says what he thinks is right he doesn't give a damn about what people think or who's going to think that oh my god what did he say and all these things so that has a lot of advantages so he's actually the first global leader to openly call out the chinese and say you're cheating okay in front of everybody so this is a very interesting event in the world uh, in the development of global trade because he's brought and because a lot of these uh, imperfections had developed in the global trading system in the global trading system in the wto system a lot of imperfections had developed a big player like china wasn't actually playing by the rules and everybody knew it and nobody had the guts to say anything so this guy comes along and he just smashes the glass bowl and just uh, tells it like it is and starts putting pressure on china okay so although everybody is actually complaining about why is he putting tariffs why is he putting tariffs on China? Why is he putting tariffs on the Europeans, etc.? And uh, uh, you know, this is not the way to do it. Nobody has offered an alternative technique, okay, as to how to fix the system. And everybody agrees that the system is broken. Everyone agrees that the system is broken. So he he's the only one who called them out openly, and he is taking certain measures by imposing tariffs. And so what you see funny, what I find funny about the way the other people are reacting, the other global leaders are reacting is that they're all saying that, no, no, tariffs, we agree that there is a problem, but tariffs is not the way to fix this problem. So if I were, and Trump has not said this, but if I were him, then I would say, okay, fine. If you think Trump tariffs are not the way, then tell me what is the way. So what they do is actually, they say, this is not the way, but they don't give you an alternative. So what's the point? You know, I don't find that very uh, constructive. If you're criticizing my method of doing something, then you should give me an alternative. So anyway, so this is what is going on now in the international uh, arena. So I think it's a very interesting time in international trade. And I think hopefully, hopefully if China comes to the bargaining table, uh, because they are actually playing quite dirty with uh, with Donald Trump and trying to, you know, play out, wait out the elections and uh, things like that. So it, I don't know how, what actually will happen with the US and China. But essentially, uh, what what uh, uh, Donald Trump has done is he's actually pointed out many uh, you know interesting new aspects of trade, which you know may, I, I no one ever no one had ever mentioned, and some of these things I've also learned uh, based on what he has done. Is one of the things if you think uh, th think what he uh, if you look at what he's done is, are you, you guys are aware that he has put steel and aluminium tariffs. You're aware, you're following this trade uh, dispute quite closely. I suggest you do because if you're going to be business students, international trade is a very important part of the business world. So I'll, I'll show you some links. I'll show you, give you some TV channels that you can look at international business television. Okay, you should follow this dispute closely because as you see this thing going on, because this guy has actually just really shaken things up and a lot of changes which were actually required are now starting to happen because he's shaken things up. So if you follow this dispute, it will not only be useful for your current affairs, etc., but it will give you a good understanding of various aspects of world trade. Okay. So one of the things if, uh, that Donald Trump has done is uh, he has put in steel and aluminium tariffs on uh, even the allies of the US, not just China, but even the allies of the US like Mexico, like the European Union, Canada. Okay. And the reason he has done that is he's talking about the importance of steel and aluminium for the defense industry. You understand that steel and aluminium is very important for defense, right? So, and the situation in the global uh, economy uh, and, and uh, you know, on, on the global stage is not exactly peaceful. There is a lot of stuff going on in the South China Sea. I don't know if you're aware that China has been building artificial islands on the South, in the South China Sea. 
okay and there was a dispute with the philippines but most of the countries in asia are not big enough to challenge china okay so they both get all of them get beaten down okay so uh, so there is a very high likelihood that there in the next four to six years they might there might be a war in the south china sea okay between the u.s and china the u.s and its allies in china there might be an invasion of taiwan that risk is also quite high okay so very recently uh, just about a week or so ago the u.s has sailed two warships through the taiwan straits okay you're aware of this taiwan problem that we have okay so uh, anyway so what has happened here clearly is that there is a very clear risk of war happening and what trump is saying is that uh, we don't want to depend because steel and aluminium are so important for defense for building all your tanks missiles and everything so these are so uh, critical and these two industries are so critical in terms of defense that we must have a domestic steel and aluminium industry okay and therefore he's putting tariffs on imported steel and aluminium and forcing uh, making those much more expensive you understand the impact of that right that if we put tariffs on imported and uh, let's say you're imagine you're in the US okay and you put tariffs let's say the US steel is selling at say $20 a ton okay and the imported steel is being sold in the US market at $18 a ton so obviously the US manufacturers will not be able to compete because their cost of production or they're selling at $20 to make a profit so what uh, what they're doing or the Trump administration is doing let's say they put a $3 or uh, $5 tariff on imported steel so now imported steel will be selling in the US at 18 plus 5 23 dollars you following okay so so dollars per ton okay so if we put a five dollar per ton a tariff i'm just giving a random example so then what happens is that imported steel in the u.s market starts selling at 23 dollars a ton and the u.s producers are selling at 20 dollars a ton so obviously they'll be able to capture more of the market the u.s producers right so this way the u.s steel and aluminium industry will be kept alive because many steel plants had closed many aluminium plants had closed in the u.s because they were getting most of the stuff from outside so one of the things that donald trump has done is that he has said he's put his foot down and said no way the steel and aluminium business is going to happen here we are going to have a thriving domestic steel and aluminium industry and if i have to put tariffs I, i'm going to do it because it's a strategic industry these are strategic industries from a defense standpoint so he sees and, and the other thing that had happened was that under eight years of obama uh, he had really uh, neglected the defense uh, sector for the US okay so he really underfunded the military so they've actually gone down a lot in strength so he has a catching up to do uh, Donald Trump has a lot of catching up to do as well on the military so because of this this is one more element that you can see that he has uh, you know brought in this aspect of uh, the defense uh, defense industry and the, the national security aspect the national security aspect of so his point is that if I'm at war with China I don't want to depend on steel coming from Canada and then I build my tanks. Okay, steel must be made internally in the US. So this the point, the very important point that comes out of this kind of discussion, that this kind of idea that Donald Trump has introduced is that, see, if you look back, this is a little bit, uh, you know, I'm putting the cart before the horse, but you guys have, some of you have fam uh, familiarity with international free trade, the theories of international trade, where we say that free trade is the best option. You guys are familiar with this idea? that free trade brings prosperity okay that the best way to have prosperity is to have free trade not to have any tariffs etc okay so just have free trade between all the countries so one of the criticisms that have been uh, leveled against uh, Donald Trump's actions in terms of imposing tariffs okay is that uh, has come from academics and other people who believe in these classical theories of free trade that the best way to have the best way to ensure prosperity is to have free trade between all the countries which is actually on its own the argument is okay it's a correct argument but there is a problem the, the problem is this is the problem that i think donald trump has brought out for the first time the problem is that all those theories in which you come out with the solution of free trade being the best option right you have all these models the best option right in those models what is happening is this what happened okay so the second point, I'm just dealing with the second point that I'm, uh, I'm uh, uh, discussing right now. Okay. So the idea is that um, uh, in the free trade, the classical free trade theories, the economists will always tell you that free trade is the best solution. Okay. Because their models give you free, free trade as the best solution. But what happens is the, pro the reason that uh, Donald Trump is actually correct. 
okay and that you need to modify the classical theories of free traders because in those models of free trade they did not they have never considered geopolitical rivalries you know what a geopolitical rivalry is you heard this term before geopolitical rivalry let me give you an example like India and Pakistan have a geopolitical rivalry India and China have a geo so from a geopolitical perspective our biggest threats are China and Pakistan okay so this is what is meant by geopolitical rivalries okay like Japan and China also have a history of conflict okay then the US and Russia have a history of conflict because of the Cold War after the Second World War okay so all these are called I mean you can refer to these as geopolitical rivalries okay geo comes from geography and political comes from politics okay so the interesting thing that the I believe that Trump is the first person to point this out is that while on its own the on paper the international uh, the the classical free trade theories are correct that free trade brings prosperity but it needs to be modified by this national security argument that Trump is putting forward because in those models we have never considered geopolitical rivalries so we came up with those classical economic theories and said that free trade is great and it's the best way to bring prosperity we have assumed automatically that everyone is at peace with other people okay we have assumed that the world is at peace and that's why we came out with those solutions that free trade is the best solution okay we assume that everyone is at peace we never assumed that there were any geopolitical rivalries that one country was trying to take down another country okay that there would be some enmity between countries those assumptions never entered into the picture and that's why you assume that free trade across across the board including steel and aluminium and everything okay are you following what i'm saying okay so here's where uh, you know trump has a lot of insights that he brings uh, to the table which i find quite fascinating because he comes up with very unique insights and internationally the media has been always trashing him so i think it's important to get a different perspective because on many matters he's actually very correct He's pointing out some important flaws in the system. Okay, so this is the thing that free trade theory, academic theories of free trade have never factored in geopolitical rivalry. They always assume that everyone is at peace with each other. But do you think that's the real nature of the world? It has never been the real nature of the world. People have always been fighting with each other. There have always been rivalries. Okay, so that's why this is actually a very interesting uh, sort of twist that he has uh, delivered to international trade theory that you have to factor in aspects of national security because you are never going to have a world which is completely at peace there are always going to be geopolitical rivalries and your defense sector has to be very strong okay and so that you are the only way you can have peace is that you, you are so powerful your military is so powerful that no one has no one dares to attack you that's the only way you can ensure peace and that will never change okay so this is a very important point to understand uh, in the because I, I wanted to tell you this because I, you will never hear this anywhere else because everybody's busy trashing Trump okay it's become fashionable to just trash Trump and people don't realize that he's actually making some very good points okay and uh, okay so the seal and aluminium is one part okay so the, on the uh, so he's introduced these uh, steel and aluminium tariffs to basically build up his uh, war machine He's also introducing some national security elements into the autos and auto parts uh, sector. Okay, that is uh, also uh, that is in a development that is happening. There you have this trade act. The trade this is basically the section of the trade act under which he's doing that. Okay, and so other international trade developments that you have to follow that you should be aware of is that uh, he has already done since Donald Trump came into office. Uh, there was a trade deal called NAFTA. Were you guys aware of that North American Free Trade Agreement? NAFTA this was basically signed by Bill Clinton okay in 19 in the uh, mid 90s or so so this uh, NAFTA was a North American free trade agreement basically between Mexico US and Canada as you know geographically if you look at the map Canada's on top US is in the middle Mexico is below the US right so they all these three countries like trading like one uh, you know big country because all the barriers to trade all the tariffs were removed most of the tariffs were removed on many of those uh, products so that's why it was called the North American free trade agreement creating one free trade zone between these three countries <coughs> so this not NAFTA actually was a very old agreement because it was done in the mid 90s as I said and it had become quite obsolete in many ways but again until Donald Trump come, came along and the US was losing out the other thing that was happening was the US was losing out big time okay because of the uh, the trend there was a trend in the post-war era okay from the 1945 onwards because the US emerged as the strongest nation after World War II they were by far the strongest and most prosperous nation 
so what they did is like a generous big brother they tried to help out all the other nations like the Europeans because Germany was devastated after the war okay and the UK was also in very bad shape okay that is one of the reasons we won independence because Hitler basically damaged the UK so much in the Second World War that the British realized that we just can't afford to maintain this colony here and all the way here in Asia anymore so partly we owe our independence to Hitler also because he basically just broke the back of the British Empire uh, Hitler and the Japanese they both broke the back of the head it's not a popular thing to say in India because we like to say it is due to us but partly we have to also recognize because the Second World War basically broke the back of Great Britain and they just couldn't afford to maintain this colony anymore so uh, so that's it so, so essentially what I was saying is that after the Second World War the US emerged as a strong and prosperous nation and they were very generous with their trade arrangements with all the other countries the losers like Germany and Japan and the other allies like the UK France okay and the Soviet Union everybody uh, and the Canadians so they gave everybody very generous trade deals so that you know you guys can also come up we are so strong and powerful that we are going to just lend you an extra helping hand we are going to give you concessional trade deals so that you guys have a chance to come up are you following what I'm saying so this was the attitude after 1945 so the US had given a lot of concessions but then from 1945 many of these countries have now developed quite a lot but these old trade arrangements had remained in place and nobody had uh, just because as I said nobody wants to rock the boat nobody wants to say unpopular things so nobody had the guts to say what Trump is now saying he's saying now that okay guys now I don't have to be uh, you know I don't have to give you concessions anymore because you guys have all grown up you are quite powerful economies now on your own so let's now trade on a fair basis on an even platform okay this is something that nobody else had the guts to do because the US because Donald Trump saw that the US was suffering because the US was giving too many concessions okay and therefore he said that no this is no longer fair you guys are now all grown up you're quite capable let's have trade on an even basis no more special concessions so this is the way he basically uh, that's why he went after NAFTA NAFTA was already a very old agreement and the US was losing out and Mexico was the biggest gainer under NAFTA okay because they were very underdeveloped and they gained a lot of development because of NAFTA and Canada was also winning so the US was losing out because from this 1945 era when the US had taken a deliberate stance to help the others and undermine its own interests okay so this is something again that Donald Trump is changing as you know NAFTA has now already been renegotiated okay you're aware of that there is a new deal it's called the USMCA the United States Mexico and Canada agreement Okay, so NAFTA is gone basically he tore it up okay so now you have this new agreement yeah we are oh we are running out of time okay you guys have a class or something to go to okay sorry I'm so sorry <laughs> but uh, anyway so we have a lot of material but we will not be able to discuss uh, that much time we don't have that much time but anyway so what I'll do then is I'll just make sure that uh, I'll just spend a little bit of time on a couple of other important things since we are discussing Donald Trump let's keep that focus and I'll just give you a couple of other important points so what he's doing is he's, he's so try to understand all this and follow this. this is a very important events because the media will not highlight it okay and that he's renegotiating a lot of trade deals South Korea US trade deal which was done under Obama has been renegotiated Obama or Clinton okay he's the old trade deal has been renegotiated by Trump a new trade deal between South Korea and the US which is fairer to the US okay a new trade deal has come up then another deal that is coming obviously the Mexico Canada have been renegotiated they're talking to Japan okay and remember they're also talking to India 